My first project was Tomcat. The reason why I got involved in Tomcat was that I wanted to show something working in a servlet engine, and I did not have access to IBM's source code, despite being an IBMer, but I did have access to Tomcat. Once I got involved in that, the Sun people, the Sun was a corporation that contributed Tomcat at the time. A few of them got together and made a release without involvement in the community, it caused a big backlash. And they decided they needed a non Sun release candidate. And I was one of the few people on the project who were not from Sun, so I became a release manager for Tomcat. And one opportunity after another was given to me at a path to work. There was a need. I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, within like three years, I was on the board of directors. Hey, great, great. Thank you. And thank you for Tomcat. I use it a lot still today. And Chris, well, same question, but may you start in the foundation and keep in the and keep growing? Yeah, no, it's a little bit interesting. So before uh, I got involved with the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation helping it start it, um, I had kind of a weird career in open source where it, it really kind of kind of evolved in high school, which was sadly a long time ago, um, hacking on FreeBSD, uh, Gentoo Linux, if people remember Gentoo, and kind of just fell in love with uh, the open source communities out there because I would ask random questions on mailing lists or Usenet, if people remember Usenet, people would just respond. Uh, it was awesome. And so eventually I started my career at IBM working on uh, a lot of JVM and Eclipse related tooling for people that remember that and eventually jumped around to Red Hat, uh, ran open source at Twitter for a while and eventually left uh, when I had an opportunity to start um, an organization where Google open source Kubernetes, they were thinking that in order for this project to be successful, they have to put it in a neutral, you know, non-for-profit, something like Apache, Linux Foundation, you know, so on. And so um, given that at Twitter, I was running containers at scale before Docker and containers were really cool. This seemed like a fun opportunity. Uh, and um, uh, essentially, we kind of built this fun ecosystem to bring um, containers and cloud native uh, to kind of the world. So it's kind of been a fun um, experience. Great. And for those of you who haven't seen like the, the post that Chris did, Kubernetes right now uh, doesn't have like one single main contributor. If you like check yeah. who is like the big, big contributor, many. Yeah, when, when it was first started, Google was by far like 90% the contributor, then Red Hat came in. And then when the foundation was built, um, it kind of helped ensure that there was trust that Google wouldn't potentially be a bad actor since the rules are fair. This is kind of the value of organizations such as like the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation, where it just levels the playing field and makes sure everyone has a fair chance at contributing and the rules are fair. Great. Uh, so uh, we are using open source and free software a lot. I mean, I use it every day in my work, when I'm coding, when I am reading documents, but I'm using my phone. Like everywhere, everywhere it's open source. I think that my car is open source. Uh, and I want to hack my car, but that's a different story. Uh, so we are using free software and open source everywhere that has taken the world. Do you think that we are in a golden age of like free and open source? Then? Um, for much of my life, it's always been to be a golden it's for much of my life, it seems to have been a golden age. I mean, I remember before there was a GPL license. I remember before Mozilla was uh, put out a browser, before the term open source. And every single time in that, it's always seemed like a golden age. I would say it's still so more today. And things like GitHub have sort of made it so that everybody can participate. Um, and the number of projects, the number of foundations, floating. Good. And Chris, same question. I mean, absolutely. I mean, when I started my career, I think Sam could attest to this, is uh, it was very difficult sometimes to use open source software and contribute to it if you're working in a company. And if you look at things today, it's a lot easier. And of course, open source is just pervasive. And, you know, it's in your, in your TV, phones, uh, unfortunately, maybe your thermostat or toaster, it's just bedded, um, you know, everywhere. Uh, and we're seeing more and more industries starting to adopt open source. Traditionally, it's been very tech heavy, you know, kind of, you know, it's called, you know, 
internet scale or large tech company, but now we're seeing, you know, areas such as the film industry. Um, you know, we recently launched something called the Academy Software Foundation, the Linux Foundation, which got the film studios working together to uh, help collaborate on open source software that they use to develop movies. Because if you think about it, if you're a film studio or a movie studio, what do you what are you really good at? You're, you 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 want to create a narrative for a movie or do that. You don't actually want to hack on the software that you use to develop the movie, right? With the value as you as an organization is higher than the commodity in terms of the software you actually use to build to build the movie. So I think we're definitely in a golden age and it continues uh, continues to grow and, and bear more new industry. Good, good. Things are moving very well. It's like you guys all the very good foundations to think. Thank you. Uh, and talking about foundations, your foundation, what do you think that it's like the best value that a patch software foundation gives to the world? I mean, we know that many things are Apache right now, and it's like a quality check when you're an Apache project. But what do you think is like the highest value that a patch foundation gives into the world? Well, our biggest pride is our community model. I mean, basically how it's been generated. We are also the model which a number of other foundations and a number of foundations create themselves and explicitly said they have modeled themselves after a patch. Uh, we don't actually proselytize. We've got numbers of projects constantly coming to want to come to us. So all we do is we, we go through a process of information or like, again, according to the community. The community. And something that most people like don't understand about uh, how this ecosystem were, they believe that it's just like coding, 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 but really it's about people, right? And that, that's what I'll be. Go ahead. Yeah. No. <laughs> cool. So building community is something that Apache does really, really well. Indeed, could you talk us a bit more about like, for example, how Apache has this framework creating a community for a starting project, then becoming like more mature one and moving on. I've got an entire presentation on that coming up. Back. Sure. So a spoiler alert, we'll talk about that later. Uh, and what about the Cloud Native Foundation? What is like the real value you are giving? Kubernetes, no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think to iterate Sam's point, vendor neutrality is deeply underrated, but I think it's super crucial to actually build sustainable ecosystem. It's like, you know, imagine, you know, a lot of these companies that are part of these communities are building businesses, right? And, you know, they want to make sure that the rules are fair, the rules of engagement are fair, so they could actually go compete. If you, it's, it's like, imagine playing like a soccer game where a team has more people on one side than the other. That's completely not fair. Foundation, you know, like Apache, Linux, you know, and then so on, basically established fair rules so everyone could have good solid governance on how to contribute and kind of compete uh, in the market. In terms of, you know, uh, Sometimes it's hard to blend the line of like, you know, CNCF Analytics Foundation. You know, I think your question was like, well, what real value that foundation provides? Um, you know, I think from a Linux Foundation perspective, I don't know how many people, at least my personal favorite thing is like, I don't know how many people um, have heard of something called Let's Encrypt, Let's Encrypt.org, free SSL certs. Everyone loves free SSL certs. So Let's Encrypt is part of the Linux Foundation, and we help kind of build and sustain that. It's now the number one certificate authority in the world. And honestly, it's like probably the most useful thing for me because I don't know people back in the day, like getting certs and all that stuff was incredibly painful. But, um, you know, we've helped build a kind of a good community around that. I mean, that's kind of one of the most valuable things that, uh, you know, we provide outside of you know, Kubernetes. Yada, yada. So it's, again, talking about community and uh, neutrality. That's a very good uh, concept that not so many people understand well. Uh, so, well, you already mentioned uh, about neutrality, and I want to ask you now about another concept that is still tricky, uh, diversity. I mean, how diverse is the Cloud Native Foundation and, and what you do to increase the diversity? Yeah, no, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting question, given that, you know, you have essentially three men on stage here, but, you know, from a CNCF perspective, uh, you know, there's a few things we do in terms of investing uh, in our community. So, one is, uh, you know, if you look at it from a, uh, like an event perspective, so we put on a lot of conferences and meetups out there. All of our conferences have uh, diversity and need-based scholarships, which helps kind of tilt things towards, 
you know, uh, improving um, over time. Um, we make sure that our uh, all of our projects have a code of conduct that are extremely welcoming. Um, you know, it's it's something that is uh, very much on a mindset of the organization. We have all of our employees go through DNI training when they uh, become part of the organization. Um, you know, we continuously uh, try to improve. Um, and one way to think about them, Frenic. From a staff perspective, we're actually uh, a lot of people don't realize, but the CNCF, uh, we're about 30 employees and a little bit more than half are, are women, which is great. But diversity is more than more than gender, right? There's different aspect, location, geo, gender, etc. And I think as long as the community is cognizant that um, there are areas to improve and processes to improve to uh, make the community truly inclusive, I think uh, you know that that's essentially step one and. Uh, essentially police yourself every year to ensure things are actually uh, progressing. Good, thank you. And what about the Apache Foundation? How do you increase diversity in the world? Uh, honestly, got to say that uh, other foundations are ahead of us. You know, they're right on. If you look at it in terms of any measure, whether it's male, female, not gender, okay, any measurement, I think we need to improve starting to become more and more just this year we created a first Chris sorry we, we created a VP of diversity and inclusion we'll probably use the most for us here through doing things like surveys and gathering data to figure out how to so we know we've got a problem we know we're starting to address we know we need to address that's the first step Great. Thank you. Thank you for taking this first step. Indeed, for you guys coming to Guadalajara, I believe it's a huge step for us because we don't see like many people uh, like you guys like every day or in. Uh... I mean, it's unfortunate. I mean, open source is truly a, a global, you know, uh, thing. So it just, uh, you know, there's lots of communities that sometimes it's hard to be everywhere. The small steps we could do to kind of uh, promote events like this and build community everywhere help, helps in the long run. Um, so, what is like the vision? What would you like to see regarding diversity in, in the future? So, in the next year, uh, how, not, not how many, but like, how would you like to see the growing of diversity in, in Apache? In the... I don't honestly know the answer. I, mean, I, I obviously. I've been to other foundations. They seem to be doing much better at it. And Chris? I mean, our approach, at least in CNCF and Linux Foundation, is we tend to do, uh, we do simply conference transparency. <laughs> speak English today. Conference transparency reports. Uh, we do kind of annual reports in terms of uh, how diverse our staff and board is. And, you know, our kind of thought process here is. Uh, Get the data out there first, and then kind of come up with actionable insights. Uh, you know, uh, from there. Good. I'm talking about more diversity in your foundations. I would like to see like half, but like this half, to start contributing to your foundations. Uh, what will be like your quick advice? I'm not that we'll talk about it like more in deep later, but a quick tip that you would like to give to everyone here, just the ones in the website. So that they start contributing to the foundation. I mean, just find a typo on a website. So start small, find something that you know how to fix. There's lots and lots of places where things get big, but start small, find deep, just say, here is here's something that really that's all I've done. So, oh. That if that's how you started, then it worked. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, for, I guess for the other half of the room. How, how many, out of curiosity, how many here are students or in university? Okay, a decent percentage. So, you know, if you're in university and student, there's a couple really good programs out there. One is run by Google called Summer of Code. Uh, and there's another one, Outreachy. There's other things like Rails, uh, Rail Girls, Summer of Code, and so on. Um, I would look for these types of programs while you're in university because they generally match you with a, uh, let's say, a more welcoming and uh, you know uh, open source project that could help you contribute, you know, over the summer or you know over the winter term. To me, that's a great um, area to start to you know learn how to contribute. Um, 
Another thought is, uh, you know, at, at CNCF, we uh, use our community to do translations for Kubernetes. So if people are looking to contribute translations, that's always a very easy kind of area and very um, thankful area for people to contribute. But in general, there are a lot more programs out there, I think, to make it a little bit easier to contribute. So if you're a student, take advantage of them. Uh, if not, um, look at some of those projects that are featured in programs like Summer Code. They tend to be um, a lot more uh, welcoming to the contribution. They even have like formal mentor programs and so on. Great, uh, thank you. So I know that this was not on the schedule, Pedro, but can I open questions to the crowd? Okay, that was fast. Sorry, I'm gonna make you guys comfortable with more questions about diversity, all right? So I'm wondering, I totally get that it's not a simple, oh, one, two, three, and it's fixed, right? It would be like assuming that politics in your government is gonna be fixed, so one, two, three, that's not gonna happen. But I am curious to hear, you two are men. What are things that you can do and you can encourage other men in your team to help make it more inclusive in the day-to-day? -day? And I'm talking about behavior in meeting, behavior in sprint and scrum plan, like that. On, on our end, uh, it's a little bit interesting where, um, you know, we're, as, as the non-for-profit, we're not like a traditional like tech company, right, where you have sprint planning and you have like little projects you know we tend to be more facilitators of communities and so one kind of unique thing at least we've done within the kubernetes community there's kind of this governance structure for example where uh there's a steering committee right these are the folks that make uh, a lot of uh important uh decisions and we require them to kind of go through um uh, dni training promoted by nc wit for example as a requirement to be on such thing um recently uh, I just had a board meeting earlier this week uh, for CNCF, and uh, we voted. This is very interesting. We have an issue where we have something called the technical board or TOC, right? It's the people who are in charge of accepting projects in the organization. We had an election earlier this year, and uh, initially, when the TOC was formed, it was nine people. Uh, one, one, one was a woman at that time. We had another election a few years later, and what happened was, you know, we ended up with with nine men. That was not ideal and so we thought like you know why did this happen what can we do to prevent this from potentially happening again so at the board meeting this week we actually voted to do two things one we had uh, we expanded we, we expanded the toc from 9 to 11 uh, and now actually mandated that at least uh, a couple of folks from the toc moving forward especially from uh, the board appointed seats uh, have to come from you know an underrepresented you know background or something so these are kind of uh small steps there's a lot other things we kind of do as an organization, but you know, uh, I think the most important thing is that we're at least cog cognitive that uh, we need to do better, and we try with like small little programs like this. So I don't know if that satisfies your answer, but those are some things that recently uh, came to mind. Uh, at Apache, we don't really have meetings, don't have problems. We need to talk things normally. There is a once a month board meeting, some talk committees. Mostly what I do is I, I mean, mostly what I have done over the past year, thought out individual thought, had merit that I thought would help with full one individual I twice at the front of the board. Um, I did push forward to make risks, uh, VP of diversity and inclusion. So it's not so much things I'm doing directly, but supporting people who could make a difference, seeking them out. Hello. Hey, this is a question more so for all three of you. What would you say is a key characteristic of a leader who wants to build a successful team as all of you direct and lead every, every day? Thank you. Me, no, oh, oh, oh come on. I, I, I'm just like providing like questions. No, 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 uh, please, please. Humility, <laughs> I mean, quite simply, if, if people are quite established talk leaders that are talk that they, uh, they want to build community, they don't want to, you want community, community to, uh, there are people who lose interest over time. You want to build a community that will help. Uh, 
best way to lead. I mean, basically, I have not pushed for pretty much any of the positions I've charged on. It's been supporting others and other people say, okay, well, you should be the leader. Take the title, but uh, you're the ones doing the work. <laughs> Humility. That's a great uh, I'm just building a team right now, and that's exactly what I, what I want to do. I'm like to create like a space so that people feel comfortable and and can like grow a community of workers, of people like pursuing the same goal. Uh, also, that's important. I mean, that you know the people that it's going to like be with you and, and share things with them, being honest. Uh, that has worked for me previously, being honest and and being supportive, and and also like. Take the support, take the help from other people. Sometimes uh, you try to do everything by yourself, and that doesn't work at all. So, like trusting your your people. Yeah, no, I think definitely like humility and trust are, are like tables to take. I mean, one thing we do is try to be as tri uh, transparent as possible, uh, at least within our our teams, in terms of you know what are what are people's goals, what are their future, you know, what's your you know. Uh, <laughs> What are your plans for the future? How can I help you get there? Because you know, in tech these, especially in technologies these days, we can't have an expectation that someone's going to work, you know, uh, for somewhere forever, right? So, what can I do to make sure that, you know, I could help and support you in your current role and maybe future roles, um, you know, uh, you know, down the line? And I just try to be transparent um, as folks. You know, we I had a kind of recent uh, recent story where uh, one of my uh, dear, you know. Uh, but, uh, folks that work for me, um, she was one of our like best developer marketing folks, uh, and she had this meeting with me. It's like, uh, you know, Chris, I'm so sorry. You know, I have to, you know, I think I'm going to go take this new offer from a company called uh, GitLab. I don't know if you heard of GitLab, or like GitHub, but like fully open source. Essentially, uh, it's kind of a similar way to think about it. And uh, you know, I was like, you know, uh, Natasha's like awesome, and you know, like I think this is good. You know, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know, as part of it. Um, you know, I also helped uh, negotiate some part of her like compensation package because a lot of people who aren't experienced may not be familiar. So, like, I just understand that, like, you know, the more you could do to kind of, you know, help people that, you know, in, in the future roles and so on, and understanding that a lot of these things are kind of transient, I think goes well. So, just keeping an, you know, honest, you know, humility and transparent relationship with with folks tends to tends to go well. Hi. Uh, but, 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 oh, more questions from the yeah. audience, I guess, sorry. Uh, what do you think will be the main obstacles a uh, new open source project faces when you're trying to build a new community? Yeah, I don't know, it depends. Yeah, yeah. And getting yourself known. Basically, there's a lot of competition, a lot of projects, getting yourself known, getting uh, know what what resources you need it's not it's not like the early days where there was so few sort of projects I don't name all. now there's just I can't even name all the ones that that many nor could I even name all the foundations I mean, it's just it's just so big yeah I think the really really Sam's point I think you know github says there's like 80 million projects out there right that like just on github there's Plenty of other places open source projects live and so i think raising awareness um is is very difficult and that, that's kind of why you see a lot of projects potentially join foundations to kind of help with that effort i also think building a true inclusive kind of community um is also very difficult um it's not you know uh, engineering is 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 is, is a hard problem along with projects but also just you know, as you build a large community, it becomes almost like a, a political process where you have to ensure that, you know, how are decisions made, you know, uh, how, you know, how do you do a release and then documenting all that. So I think um, it's, uh, it, you know, making sure your project's well known and truly, you know, inclusive is, are, are very hard uh, problems that I think uh, to be focused on to really make the project successful. Well, Thank you for coming, guys. Thank you for coming. Really, it's uh, great uh, to have you here in Guadalajara. And it's uh, an open invitation for you to be part of the next uh, Java Dev Day. Uh, we really enjoy uh, that you will be part of the top speakers. And the question, probably, this question will be focused more to Sam. 
I also work a lot with the Tomcats, a lot with the Spring. And as Eric said, uh, thank you for that. And well, the question is that probably this will be a, a talk from an hour probably. What will be the, what were the, let's say, the most challenging thing when you work with Tomcat or when you develop Tomcat? Uh, Tomcat, when I started, mostly right ones run everywhere. It basically, at the time I was using Windows, I don't use Windows, but I did use Windows. And it did not run on Windows. And so I spent much of my time fixing it so that it would. Um, and that's how I got started. I make basically trying to just simply make it work. But uh, the biggest problems are the inclusive nature of me. I actually, that was my second project. The first one was PHP. I was wanted to integrate um, scripting language with Servlet Engine. The PHP and Tomcat were obvious candidates. Uh, I submitted an email to a mailing list to PHP saying, I've got this idea and I sketched out how to approach it. Here's your CVS. It really was as simple as that. CVS being the first version with the first which it yet. Um, and that doesn't exist anymore. Typically now you've got to go through and establish yourself as the person who's distributed. But once I did that and I saw how open it could be, then I went to Tomcat and they were on the other end of the thing. And I said, no, 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 you got to open up. You got to let other people in. So trying to make it so that other people could it was the biggest issue, not technically. I mean, yes, I had to make it for pick up the Building community was from point to point. And that came from a geek. I, mean, I wrote code and it, I didn't actually do much community building, whatever, but I did. And that's what helped me. Out. Kai? Okay. Um, what do you think about the burnout inside the open source? And how you manage this type of um, burnout? And well, um, um, one more question: How do you think about the the term "ghost war" in the open source member? First question was burnout. What do you think about burnout in open source project? Uh, burnout is when you feel like uh, ghost work. Ghost work. Burnout and ghost work in an open source project. Uh, oh, but born out and burnout ghost work. and ghost work. So burnout, work. like feeling like so stressed. And, and ghost work, like. Uh, what is ghost after work? After hours. Uh. <laughs> uh, for, I know that's skunk work. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll answer Go, the Ghost work, sorry. Ghost work uh, uh, is non remunerated, uh, non compensated activities. So I'll start with burnout since we've, um, you know, in the like last four years, you know, the Kubernetes community has grown significantly, right? And there's a lot of early people that, um, you know, have basically come to the foundation organization is like, I, I just can't, I'm doing pull requests all the time. And, you know, they are. Uh, most people are gainfully employed by like a Google or a Microsoft or a small startup, but it's just so much work dealing with the scale of something. And so at the last, uh, the last KubeCon um, in Europe, we started to partner um, with this organization called, uh, uh, I think it's OSMI, Open Source, in, open source Mental Health, health uh, Open Source Mental Health, I think Awareness is the name of the organization. And so what we did at the conference is we had a little booth had a, um, essentially, we created like a little pocket guide that people could pick up and to give some tips with a recognizing burnout, uh, how to potentially deal it, deal with it and some resources. Like it's, I think everyone goes through it in their career, especially like I've gone through it a couple of times where I had to just, you know, quit my job and take a, f a few months off. And it, it's just like, it's different for everyone. But I think, you know, uh, just like with diversity and inclusion, recognizing that there, it, is, it is a problem, 
and, and raising visibility to it and providing people access to the resource and help uh, helps improve things. But I don't think there's an easy, quick solution, but there are some organizations out there working, uh, working on it, and all of us should try to raise the visibility um, uh, of them. I think it's OSMI. And if you go to, you Google like CNCF, OSMI, you'll find the, the little booklet that, that we put together. So that's good. I've avoided burnout by basically every three years with a different staff for a different role on a faculty. I mean, I was on the board for a number of years, which the president before that, the VP of infrastructure, VP of legal affairs, secretary, uh, burnout is a real problem. Each time I did that, I always approached trying to figure out who my success would be. Try to always bring up somebody else. Uh, and so all throughout my time at Apache has been identifying other individuals that I think could step up and do more and try to encourage them to do more. And that, you know, every time that happens, I feel better. I don't you know. And then your second question, I think, was regarding like, um, so uncompensated labor for open source. Yeah, so like, that's an interesting question because I like, I, uh, you know, a long time ago, I was also kind of, you know, I started hacking on Linux because in FreeBSD, just because I was interested, I wanted to learn, right? I was not compensated, but I was learning. It eventually helped me luckily land my first internship at IBM, which, you know, gave me a career and I've been fortunate ever since. But there are a lot of developers out there that may, I don't know, build a Node.js library that all of a sudden is used by millions of people and they're not, you know, paid for it at all. I, there's, you know, there's, there's, it's a multifaceted problem. You know, I think a lot of people try to coin this as like open source sustainability, right? How do we sustain these things that are kind of under the radar and used by many people? I think one is, you know, there's a couple approaches. One, if you're if you're an open source developer and you've maintained a couple things and, you know, pick some maybe, uh, let's call them more hot project, like a GraphQL or Kubernetes, it's very easy. It's, it's much more easier to find employment these days, I think, if you have a cornerstone technology associate or you contribute. Like there's, when, when I was actually, when I was at Twitter, uh, we, we, we wrote these crazy uh, scripts, I wrote these batch scripts that would go scan open source repositories that we depended on for contributors to projects we cared about and basically pinged our internal LDAP servers to check that they were in employees and fed those directly to recruiters. So I think, you know, uh, understanding that there is a market for certain types of technologies to get, you know, jobs helps, but, you know, <sighs> sustainability is a hard thing. It's, it's, there's no easy thing. Like, you know, you look at the OpenSSL problem where OpenSSL was maintained by two people named Steve, uh, which, which was a huge issue. And, um, you know, and there's probably trillions of dollars every day that flow through OpenSSL and that, that, like stuff like that has to kind of be surfaced and, and, and sustained. I just, I don't know if that really answers your questions. I think the problem, but. The <laughs> and I'm probably not the one to ask for the second question because when I, mean, I joined IBM out of college 38 years ago, I did uh, in the late 90s explore looking elsewhere and got myself known in the open source community and that got myself more value at IBM. So IBM has done well by me until I've never had new. Yeah, it's, I think if you're, it, it, open source contributions will help you generally find a job in the future, especially if they're for, you know, very relevant projects for, for, for companies, but it is a tough, it is a tough problem. I've been very fortunate. Sometimes even uh, presenting, you know, at, at a conference will help raise your visibility. Yeah, get simply done. Look good on your resume. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So we recently started a group of uh, open source developers in bioinformatics to become contributors. Um, one of the things we saw in the workshop is that the first thing to, to start being a contributor is to lose the fear in a contributor. And, and so I wanted to uh, from you some words of advice, especially for students that, that uh, want to give that first step, but you know, you feel like maybe my bug fix is not smart enough. Maybe, and, and you hear that a lot, and it's amazing people, but you know, imposter syndrome is quite uh, prevalent in our communities. So I wanted to, to ask you for those words. Um, yeah, no, no. So, I, you know, earlier I mentioned um, there are certain different open source projects and communities out there that are a little bit more inclusive and, and nicer 
to kind of work with, I would choose those first uh, versus some other ones where people, you know, like, you know, I, I you know, there's a couple projects recently, um, you know, that were part of CNCF where one of the maintainers was, uh, I, I, I think he was suffering burnout a little bit and someone sent them a pull request to like correct the spelling of something. And he was just like, so pissed and just like closed the issue and was just like, please stop gaming commits. And like, I think trying to find a project that is more welcoming, will will we'll go, uh, we'll, we'll make their life a little bit easier. I don't know if that's the best advice, but um, sometimes maintainers are, uh, some projects are better than others, let's put it this way. I don't think I got much to add to that other than being persistent. I mean, if you get um, the way it's going, it's worth it. Yeah, there's certain types of projects. I think um, we're getting close to Halloween, so it's like Hacktoberfest season. So, so you could go find those projects tend to be a lot more welcoming. Um, there's also on Twitter, I think there's like good first issues, weak little bot that will go pop things. So find, find those and, and start. I, I just like to, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's something. Uh, el problema que comentas, o sea, lo que comentó de, de ¿cómo, ¿cómo te llamas? Alejandra, eh, sobre cómo combatir ese miedo a mandar tu primer contribución. Eh, es el problema que más vivimos invitando a gente a este evento. So, I mean, that, that issue is what we face the most when inviting people and companies to this event. Most of the answers were, oh, I'm, I'm not contributing already. I will go once I have contributed and I can present a success story. And we were like, no, no, this is about learning to contribute. You know, like we're all in the same stage, you know. Developers, uh, I don't know if, you, you would know better if it's a cultural thing or not, but I think in Latin America, we have like a big like, oh, I'm not worthy issue, you know, like, I don't know if my code will be good enough. Uh, so I spoke with several companies to invite them and many of said, them said, oh yes, I use Apache Airflow and, I, and, and we use it and we have modified it and everything. And I was like, okay, have you sent any pull requests? Or, oh, no, I think it's not good enough. It, it only works for us, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, we do face that a lot. So hopefully from this, uh, we will learn to, to, to get rid of that fear. Always start small, the best advice. Okay. Okay, acá, última pregunta. Thank you. Well, uh, just a little bit of context. I started working on a project uh, with many new technologies, right? So we are going to Spark and Kafka, and we are setting up our delivery pipeline. And what is happening is that a lot of strong opinions on different sides. There are some teams in China, there are some teams in Mexico, and everyone wants to do their own stuff. So I wanted to ask you what is, if you can talk about, about your decision process or your how you make decisions across the projects that you have in your organization that say, what is the best direction to take? Because at the beginning, there are so many unknowns. There are so many things that you don't know if it's going to work or not. So when you choose, uh, how do you choose? Okay, let's go in this strategy, this direction, or these tools, or these features. How do you have like a board, an architect route? Uh, if you can talk a little bit about your decision making process. Um, sort of exactly the opposite. The Apache board does not make technical decisions. The Apache project chair does not make technical decisions. There's Apache project management committees that will decide when releases happen, but the people who make decisions at Apache are the people doing the work. So the people who submit the patches are the ones who have say in which way things go. It, I then basically you leverage the decision that the people that is going to do the real thing, right? So, uh, part like the board, you don't take those, but you let other people that is more experienced and take that decision. So, basically, you let the people doing the, the real things take the final decision. Correct. People doing the work, 
question. Similar to how kind of the FERC project kind of decide on their own kind of what work and they have a documented governance their decision making process essentially. But that's from like a foundation perspective. Like your question almost sounded from like a like a business perspective, like as a company, you know, which technologies, you know, could I potentially choose? And I think that's a tough question and, and kind of depends. Like I, I'm I'm a huge fan of like choose the boring stuff that works um, and, and stay away from the new shiny things if you're trying to run a business. Uh, except for Kubernetes. Kubernetes is great, but uh, other other <laughs> other 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 than that, uh, you know, it, it depends on on the organization. Great. Thank you guys. Well uh, we're running out of time, so it's just Again, thank you. <laughs> and if you want to give a message to the people here, uh, will be really great. You can just share something with us. Sure. Uh, you know, as lo siento, I should try to talk a little bit more in Spanish. And, you know, me, mi esposa is from CDMX, and it's a little bit shameful that <laughs> my Spanish is not so good. But uh, thank you for um, you know uh, doing this event, and I'm happy to. I'm like super stoked to, to be here, and hopefully we could do more of these uh, uh, events, uh, hopefully all over Mexico. Thank you. Tengas miedo. Get started. <laughs>